Greetings, true believers and newcomers alike. You're listening to the DCAU Review, hosted by Cal and Liam, streaming at DCAUreview.com and on your favorite podcast app, Excelsior! They are young men and women with unimaginable powers. It's like hard enough just being normal, you know? And together, they're an unbeatable force. We are the X-Men! X-Men Evolution. Welcome, everybody, to episode 303 of the DCAU Review. I am one of your hosts, Cal, and with me, my good friend and good brother, Liam. Liam, it is that time of year again. The time for practical jokes and uh, generally not being able to trust anyone's social media uh, posts on the, on the Day of Fools. That's right. It is our third annual April Fools episode, and uh, I, somehow we ended up with uh, with yet another Marvel cartoon for this <laughs> for this year. I, we've set the precedent at this point. If we very uh, too far from Marvel. I feel like we're breaking tradition at this point. But hey, mm-hmm. the people demanded it. Also, we worked in a little bit of corporate synergy here with some <laughs> SEO stuff. Uh, excited to, t- to tackle our third annual uh, d- d- adventure away from Detective Comics Comics for a week. Absolutely. Face front, true believers. It's uh, We're back and... Uh, we we made the executive decision that it would be an X Men review, uh, as Cal said, not at all in a cynical attempt to uh, to cash in on on the the current ongoing uh, X Men ninety seven show, which people were raving about. Uh, so we decided we were definitely going to do an X Men thing, but uh, to let the uh, the listeners have a little bit of a say this year, we decided to uh, uh, this year we decided to uh, put it to a vote with four different X-Men cartoons, including the brand new X-Men 97, which just started airing on Disney+. Plus. We also put up the original recipe X-Men, the animated series from the 90s. Uh, we put up Wolverine and the X-Men from the uh, later 2000s or maybe early 2010s. And finally, we put up our winner uh, of the poll, in fact, just barely, but uh, edging all of them out is the early 2000s uh, uh, maybe a little bit of a hidden gem in Marvel a- animations, or maybe not one that's talked about as much. None other than X Men Evolution is on the docket for this year's April Fool's review. That's right. We'll be reviewing the episode, technically, I guess the pilot episode, which is called mm-hmm. Strategy X. We'll be getting into our breakdown of this. A uh, little bit of background, Liam, as you said, this is sort of the I would I would compare this to. Uh, Kids WB's The Batman, which was obviously a follow up to what is now a legendary mm-hmm. cartoon that was somewhat overshadowed by the fact that it had some gigantic shoes to fill as a follow up and maybe didn't quite attract the same type of viewer or appreciation, critical acclaim. Although this is an award winning series, it did wo- uh, win a daytime Emmy Award. Uh, but this uh, this series, interestingly enough, I think even before we put this on the list, uh, we have a particular fondness of this. This was our main introduction to the X Men. Uh, we uh, we were not original X Men animated series viewers. No. Uh, yeah, despite despite watching all those other ancillary Marvel animated shows between spider-man and iron man and fantastic four and even a little bit of the incredible hulk as we talked about last year x-men never made it on our watch list so uh despite uh us growing up at a time and a place where we probably should have and we're right right in the wheelhouse of appreciating that show we have no uh no attachment to that original x-men series so uh this was our introduction and our our appreciation i think for these characters along with maybe the i I don't know that you you were uh of age to see it but the the uh the x-men live action 20th century fox movies which came out Mm -hmm. uh right around this time also grew in popularity and interest for me at least uh for the characters so uh it, yeah it's it's interesting because this this series had those gigantic shoes to fill and um you know I think based on everything that I read about the show and some of its production there's a lot of lot of uh mirrored images for some of the things that we've heard from 
uh, showrunners and production happening on both uh, Batman the Animated Series and I think even more closely with Batman Beyond based on mm-hmm. some of the asks from the network and what they were looking for and uh, what this particular show ended up being able to do. It lasted four seasons. Uh, it was originally slated or I think the producers and creators had hoped that it would get a fifth season because the fourth season sort of ends on a cliffhanger. Uh, but uh, the fifth season never did come around. There was a brief tie-in comic that was associated with it. So it, it kind of followed that same recipe as the the other animated series, superhero animated series of that uh, that time frame. But uh, I just don't don't know that it gets much respect or interest just because of the legendary status of the original X-Men animated show. Uh, so, uh, hey, why not? If you if you have not watched this, obviously, there's enough people that have watched it to give this the slim victory uh, from mm-hmm. our from our followers on on uh, the the website formerly known as Twitter now X. So uh, between that and our Instagram poll, this got the most votes. So uh, somebody out there had some sort of familiarity and appreciation for it. But I think just in the in the mind's eye that that original series holds such a gigantic place in people's hearts uh also thus why the recent reboot of the series came out uh it's 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 hard to hard to be the person that's called on to to follow up such uh, mm-hmm. a show with that sort of reputation isn't it <laughs> absolutely um and i think the the point of difference is also um those x-men toys in the 90s we talk about that all the time with the <laughs> counter batman figures Uh, The Toy Biz, Marvel, uh, X-Men, and Spider-Man toys were everywhere. We didn't, as you said, we didn't watch the show, but we definitely had a Wolverine and a Cyclops and a couple other, even some we may have picked up from like secondhand stores, but we we had X-Men toys and we didn't even watch the X-Men show. So (laughs) I think that that those those toy lines go hand in hand. And this X-Men Evolution show did have like a six inch toy line that I think only was like one series and mm-hmm. they weren't particularly well made from my recollection. Yep. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think that's also kind of goes hand in hand. Similarly, I would argue to, to the Batman and, and even, uh, and even maybe the T Titan show, which, which is, I think the, the ancillary merchandise also often plays a, uh, a part in something becoming a, a real staple of, uh, of someone's childhood uh, as opposed to maybe just being, uh, oh yeah, I remember that show <laughs> type of thing, <laughs> which this uh, this show may fall into, um, which is a shame because having gone back and watched a few episodes of the original X Men show, uh, I think this is way better. Yeah. So <laughs> controversial um, take already here. Send yeah. all of your hate to Liam directly yes. on uh, on on Twitter or uh, or on Facebook or uh, Instagram at DCAU Review. <laughs> Absolutely, bring it on. But uh, but yes, a lot to talk to, and yeah, like you said, this is uh, this is kind of our our. X Men show and um, it it doesn't it doesn't as closely adhere I think to the comic book the classic comic book version they play with the ages of some of the characters obviously it's set in a high school uh, or all or the main cast of uh, of X Men are all going to, to the same high school so it's uh, with, with the exception of a couple of uh, teachers uh, that are that are around who are a little bit older but yeah they they uh, they kind of cut their own path and uh, I'm excited to get started here. But of course, Cal, I must first regale us with the one year, one time a year only a uh, very special Marvel uh, IMDB synopsis for this week's episode. That's right, Liam. Uh, and of course, as we mentioned at the top, this, uh, this is uh, the pilot episode of X-Men Evolution, also uh, titled Strategy X, which according to uh, Wikipedia originally debuted here in the States on the Kids WB programming block on Saturday, November the 4th, 2000, meaning we will be coming up on the 24 year anniversary of this in just a few short months. And of course, the official IMDb synopsis is brought to you by, as it always is, the Pod Tower. Head over to youtube.com slash the Pod Tower today. And not only can you check out our entire library, which also features our past April Fool's Day episodes. Check those out in the archives if you want to hear our thoughts on the Spider-Man, the animated series pilot episode and a Iron Man and Incredible Hulk crossover episode, which was a fun one from last year. But you also get the entire 
Tim Talk Library, which was uh, another podcast that ran for so many years, covering uh, all of the DCAU and a whole bunch of other stuff, as well as the ongoing Jump on the Batwagon series from the folks at Watchtower Database, all in one convenient place for your streaming pleasure. Head over to there today to youtube.com slash the pod tower today and subscribe. That's right. So this is the synopsis for Strategy X, which was written by Rick Unger, Bob Forward, and Avi Arad, super normal guy, directed by <laughs> Frank Parr. Hey, there's a familiar name. Yeah. Uh, music by William Anderson and animation by Madhouse. And that synopsis reads as such. <laughs> My throat's a little sore, so we're going <laughs> to... How are on through? You got this. <clears throat> When high schooler Todd Talansky starts exhibiting toad-like mutant powers, Mystique sees a perfect opportunity to get in, get a spy into Xavier's Institute. Meanwhile, the X-Men recruit a new member as Kurt Wagner joins Xavier's school. Excelsior! Well done. Well done. Every year, it just floors me that we get to do this. And uh, it's the highlight of uh, certainly of the April Fool's <laughs> holiday, if not my entire year, to hear you do an entire synopsis as uh, one Stanley Lee. Um, yes, my, my, vo- my vocal cords really, uh, it can really only be once a year, I think. <laughs> the strain that the Stanley voice puts on that. It is a big ask, but we uh, we appreciate your service, sir. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I will I will just mention this fun factoid. I didn't know where else to insert this here, but fun factoid: uh, during production, the original name for this series was not going to be X Men Evolution, but was in fact going to be X Men Children of the Atom, which apparently uh, has been the title of a few other things, including a video game uh, yes. a series in the comics, also. So there's uh, that that name was tossed about and uh but i think ultimately they landed on x-men evolution which did it just rolls off the tongue a little bit easier than (laughs) x-men children of the (laughs) atom a little bit yeah it's a little bit uh it fits on a lunchbox easier you know for sure absolutely oh also speaking of video games i'd be remiss not to mention x-men legends because that is that's my true x-men gateway drug i think there you go uh send us your yeah if you're familiar if you're a big x-men fan we'd love to hear how you uh how you became a fan of theirs whether it was comic books uh perhaps the Mm old-fashioned way maybe it was uh hey maybe it was one of those arcade games uh the Mm x-men arcade games people love those things the capcom Mm x-men arcade games x-men versus street fighter kicked it all off and yeah marvel versus capcom came along afterwards but yeah that was a big uh, jumping on point yeah absolutely so maybe that was one of your uh, introductions there let us know uh this week uh via either the uh the dcau twitter or instagram we love to hear your thoughts on that uh liam let's get back to here as we do our own plot synopsis though so we open things up here uh we are not uh where where it's not typically Bayville that X Men is usually take uh, the the school is right they this no, is it's a, usually a Westchester I yeah, believe I was gonna say that's where that's where the Xavier Institute is generally located right so they this is just the first of many things as we mentioned that were adjusted and um I we would be we remiss not to. Uh, speaking of parallels between Batman Beyond and this show, uh, the some of the producers, including uh, Boyd Kirkland, of course, who was uh, certainly worked on a lot of Batman the Animated Series and mm-hmm. uh, did some other work on on DCAU projects as well. Uh, he's a producer on this. Several interviews with his work uh, regards to his work on this show, he mentioned. Uh, the direct influence from the show Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which mm-hmm. we know was a rather large influence for Batman Beyond, and especially with the the network's push towards uh, Batman Beyond. So Bayville, and I think isn't Sunnydale the the uh, the the town in Buffy? I, I feel like I believe so. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not a, not a Buffy uh, up on my Buffy uh, knowledge as much maybe as I should be, but uh, yeah, Bayville feels like just like a like a sister sister town to Sunnydale. So <laughs> uh, we we kick things off at a Bayville high school football game, and we'll talk about it in animation and visuals. But it's always funny to see uh, teams or 
people that are probably not familiar with the game of American football animate anim- <laughs> a, a scene featuring a lot of action in, in American football, but we'll talk about that in animation and visuals, but a game is occurring and boy, howdy, the Bayville high team is absolutely crushing their competition. Uh, we noticed that there's an onlooker who's taking some photographs of the absolute decimation of their rivals and uh, Bayville High scoring a touchdown with a, a young Gene Gray taking pictures of the star quarterback who Duncan Matthews, who uh, scores an easy touchdown. And uh, during this bit, uh, they're they're having a little bit of a flirtatious interaction. We cut to a young man wearing red sunglasses sitting in the uh, in the bleachers. And it's none other than, of course, Scott Summers, who anybody who knows knows anybody about x-men uh of course is uh is romantically interested in gene but uh, we hint at perhaps a little bit of uh jealousy here as uh duncan is f- certainly flirtatious with gene uh during this whole whole bit though uh there's a a young man who's sneaking around that we'll learn is none other than the aforementioned todd talansky interesting name uh he's hopping around a bit and appears to be uh, enjoying himself uh, helping himself to people's pockets. Uh, he's going in, grabbing some wallets, uh, money, whatever they can find. And uh, it's interesting because uh, as t- as Scott is sitting on the bleachers watching the football game, he's able to see Talansky reaching down and grabbing one of the fans wallets. So he goes off to investigate. Meanwhile, uh, Talansky has also caught the attention of uh, the the typical high school football bullies who are interested in trying to uh to push Talansky around a little bit oh, hey if it ain't Tody Talansky picking up a little spare change uh, hi Duncan uh, look I can explain shut up uh, frog face uh, let's crush him dunk let's not dunk just chill the wallets are still there how about we have them give back the cash no harm done yeah yeah see uh, here's the money what do you care about this scuzzo summers not much but i'm not crazy about three against one either so how about we settle this peacefully i think me and my buds are gonna squash this slime ball so you and your stupid sunglasses at night can just bail <laughs> <sighs> I said, knock it off! Hey! Hey! He's getting away! Of course, with Talansky jumping around a bit like an amphibian, he seems to make a bit of a fool of the football players who fall in the mud. They're not too happy about it. They charge. They He gets into it with Scott. And, of course, Scott's sunglasses get knocked off in the moment. And, and uh... He accidentally discharges in a a eye blast out and uh, unfortunately hits a propane tank, which causes it to explode mid game. uh, And this causes quite the bit of a kerfuffle. Uh, We we learn that uh, unfortunately that calls an end to the game. And thankfully, no one is seriously injured. But we see that Gene is there comforting Duncan as he's let off on a stretcher. Scott is not too happy about this. Unfortunately, uh, the unintentional blast ultimately leading to his uh, his crush being uh, consoling his potential rival. So as Duncan is carried off. Uh, and, and Gene comforts him. We see a, uh, a a car pull up with a recognizable silhouette of a bald headed man sitting in the back. And as the people investigating the situation begin to put a couple of things together, it appears that uh, one of them is about to lay the blame on potential mutants. But uh, he's manip- briefly manip- uh, manipulated by uh, Professor X, who is the bald-headed man in the back of the car, in case you couldn't put two and two together. And suddenly the detective changes his mind and simply simply blames it on the leaky propane tank. And uh, it's at that point that uh, everyone leaves the scene. Uh, and uh, they, uh, Professor X, uh, who is accompanied by uh, Storm, also known as Aurora, are, are headed off to the train station to meet a new recruit, for their school of gifted youngsters, a Kurt Wagner, uh, who is mentioned there. So they're off to the train station. And meanwhile, we're, uh, we're reminded that there's, or introduced to yet another familiar face here at a, uh, nearby, nearby convenience store as a motorcycle arrives and a man who's very thirsty shows up. 
Yeehaw. Yeah, it's uh, it's none other than uh, Logan, aka Wolverine, who's arrived to uh, to fuel up, and uh, and he sees a a paper, a local newspaper. You see newspapers, kids, for these <laughs> things where something uh, of note would happen, and then you would print it, and there would perhaps be a picture taken, and then that would be printed like overnight, and then folks would read about it the following day. Crazy. Um, yeah, and uh, it's it's crazy to think about now. But uh, yeah, that's uh, so Logan sees that, and uh, after we we get a little uh, cute visual comedy of uh, of revealing his claws a little bit as he cuts the head off of a water bottle. We go outside. We see him about to get back on his motorcycle. Uh, seems that he is heading home, wherever that may be. And then uh, just for fun, we cut up to a nearby cliff. And there's, which, I mean, obviously anyone who knows the X-Men knows who this is, but we just see a guy in a trench coat with sharp teeth growling, <laughs> uh, looking down at Wolverine, and then we never see him again for the rest of the episode. It is, of course, uh, Wolverine's famous comic book rival, that being uh, Sabretooth, who is uh, is tracking Logan as uh, as Logan heads back to town. From there, we cut to uh, after uh, after Charles and uh, and Storm bring Kurt home from the bus station. We cut to to Scott and Jean back at the Xavier Institute for Gifted Youngsters, which is where they all live in this supposed boarding school. And uh, as Scott and Jean prepare to go out, they are introduced to Mr. Wagner, who is uh, completely cloaked in this large robe and uh, complete with a hood and. As he uh, finally extends his hand a little bit reluctantly to shake Scott's hand, we see that he is uh, he's blue, he's furry, and he's only got three fingers. We're heading out, Professor. Just a moment, you two. Come here. I'd like you to meet someone. This is Kurt Wagner. He arrived late last night. Hey, Kurt. This is Gene. I'm Scott. How you doing? Kurt, you're among friends here. Hello. I was just telling Kurt how I set up this institute for gifted youngsters. Youngsters whose gifts are not always an asset. Right, Scott? Uh, so you heard about last night. Difficult not to. It was on all the news channels. It was a bad situation, and there was an accident. I'm sorry. I know. Fortunately, no one was badly hurt and the true cause was not discovered. But you must be more careful, Scott. Come on, Professor. I'm packing a bazooka behind each eyeball. What do you want from me? Control, Scott. That's what you're here to learn. That's why you're all here. Scott's eyes emit a destructive optic blast beam. Oh, cool. How about you, Kurt? Got a special gift that brought you here? Maybe. Whoa. Whoa. I'll be helping Kurt get settled in. We can talk more tonight. And, uh, of course, uh, Xavier is reinforcing that it's it's okay to make mistakes, but that Scott has to be in a little bit better uh, better control. And uh, to me, I say, hey, man, why don't you get him a chain for those glasses, then? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Or give him, I don't know, so, something else. Wrap around pair, like, you know, yeah. like, like Charles Oakley of the National Basketball Association would yeah. wear in the NBA in the 90s and 80s. Absolutely. There are there are ways, but whatever. It's fine. Uh but yes, so as as Scott and uh as Scott and uh, Xavier continue speaking, Scott mentions that he uh, had recently uh, uh met this Todd Talansky fellow and that uh he thinks it might be a good idea for him to bring Todd to the school to meet with Xavier and see if he might be willing to join them. And uh, then we cut to the aforementioned Mr. Talansky, who is waiting outside the principal of Bayville High School's uh, office. And uh, this uh, principal, Dark Holm, as she is called. Very na- normal name. Uh huh. Super, super cool. A lot of people <laughs> have that name. Uh, bring, brings uh, Todd into, into her office and uh, mentions that she saw he was recently uh, getting uh, a little bit friendly with, uh, with Scott Summers. And uh, instructs him to uh, to try to uh, deepen that friendship as a way of getting inside the Xavier Institute and uh, doing a little bit of reconnaissance. And uh, when Todd isn't quite sure if he wants to move forward with that plan, 
uh, we suddenly see that uh, Miss Starcolm also has a special gift of her own as she transforms into this uh, very, very scary anime monster thing, <laughs> uh, which we'll talk more about in visuals. But uh, she makes it clear that this is not a optional assignment for Mr. Talansky. Excuse me a moment while I open a window. There. Now, Toad. Shall we talk about your new friend, Scott Summers? What about him? <laughs> He's cool. Heck, wasn't for him, them jocks would have stomped my skull flat. Yes, well, Summers, as you've noticed, has special powers. There are others like him. We need to know more. Much more. Oh, uh, look, I don't want... Science! You'll do as you're told! Understand! And from there, we uh, we cut back to, uh, I guess, addressing the problem, which I think this is something that they have done in the comics as well. But uh, since in, for the purposes of this show, um, which I don't even know if they really address that head on in this episode, I would say mm-hmm. it's not it doesn't seem that uh, the public at large is aware of what mutants are or that they're like a significant portion of the populace yet mm-hmm. um the world at large is not uh, not familiar so uh in order to help kurt blend in so that he can still attend high school with his fellow classmates uh charles pre- presents him with a little uh, magic watch a little hologram technology that will allow kurt to uh to look uh look uh, like a a normal human student uh, although uh, storm is uh, is wisely there to remind him that uh just because uh just because it, or she's there to remind him that he he's normal whether he's wearing the watch or not and that uh, this is really just a disguise to help him blend in uh, from folks who wouldn't quite understand his uh, unique condition to say the least yeah absolutely so we get our i mean that's a that's a uh, a familiar and constant trope in x-men comics well, obviously uh so it, one of the things I did read about this interestingly is that uh, obviously this is early 2000s. So uh, not as uh, not, not the same place we are culturally now, I would say uh, okay. by any means, but uh, the producers did, did their best to still try and, and at least uh, reference the source material here. But uh, as we continue on here, uh, we're going, we head back to school with uh, Scott going into his locker at uh and uh getting his lunch and uh as he uh, as he's in the cafeteria uh scott's talking to one of the other other people in the area but uh is interrupted by uh, one todd Tolansky who mentions that uh, he's suddenly very interested in uh the powers that uh that he noticed that scott may have revealed uh in front of him and uh it is now very obvious that uh Todd is not interested in hiding his own powers and is hopping around his elongated tongue is eating flies out of the air and he even begins snatching away Scott's glasses uh, before Scott demands that he get him back noting that uh he saw what happened the last time that uh, that happened so he gives him back to him but uh he uh he concludes at that point that uh the two of them are sort of in the same boat and decides uh, to see if he can invite him back to the uh, the, the school. Uh, unfortunately, though, Todd Todd is not interested at that time. He jumps out uh, jumps out a window before Scott can get him to agree. So uh, we flash back to the the school for gifted youngsters, and uh, Professor X is uh, using Cerebro as so we get Cerebro's first appearance in the show. Uh, he's sitting at a desk. It's sort of a headset, sort of homage to 90s computer uh a computer game or something like that he's wearing this over the top headset and has this vr set up i guess what you would think that modern day gamers would be in the 19 like if you thought about it in the 1990s this yes, kind of absolutely it's kind of what i i thought it's, it's pretty it's pretty similar to the headsets that robin and the commissioner and batman wear in uh uh what is reality the uh the beat up <laughs> it's very similar uh it's a lot of wires coming and directly hooked into uh, Xavier's brain, as it appears. Absolutely. So uh, we get Kurt uh, being introduced. We kind of get a little bit of filler and some uh, exposition as to what it is that Cerebro does. Uh, Professor X, of course, lets it, lets uh, Kurt know that it allows him to de- detect mutant activity in and around uh, the world. And uh, it sort of enhances his own uh, 
um, telekinetic powers to be able to identify when those powers are being used to hopefully help and recruit uh, those those that uh, have the mutant gene. So uh, at this point, Scott walks in and expressed <laughs> express a rather uh, unsavory opinion of of Todd, expressing not only his personal hygiene but generally the way that he carries himself as not being optimal for a recruit. But Professor X isn't ready at that point to give up on recruiting Todd and suggests that maybe they bring him to the mansion as a uh, for a potential recruitment discussion. So it's at that point that. Uh, Professor X enlists the help of of uh, of Storm, who is uh, I love this scene. She's uh, we'll talk about it maybe in visuals, but she's using her powers to uh, to water plants in the uh, greenhouse. So she uh, she's recruited to uh, to help kind of lay this this trap where uh, she gets Toad, who uh, shows up to the mansion in a brand new battle suit as it describes on the x-men evolution wikipedia uh he shows up <laughs> and wouldn't you know it just as he shows up the weather begins to change uh, it goes from a very clear starry night sky to clouds thunder and lightning and strong winds that literally literally blow him through the doors of the x-men mansion and uh, waiting inside is uh, none other than Nightcrawler himself, Kurt, who's uh, wearing his new suit. I guess, I guess the first thing you do is you get admitted to the school, and then they they uh, they they fit you for your ex uh, your ex suit because uh, either that or Kurt was prepared when he arrived there. They just gave him the belt, maybe. But, yeah, uh, they, yeah, they do show the, the the belt and what appears to be the little. What is that? I guess the vest, whatever that that yeah. thing, that Nightcrawler vest thing. Uh, yeah in a little package waiting for him in his bedroom. So yes. they, yeah, they, they brought him the, uh, <laughs> the whole outfit here. Whoa, <laughs> what are you? Some kind of ratty plush toy? <sighs> the name's Nightcrawler. And at least I don't reek like unwashed lederhosen. You blue furred freak! Ah! As you say in America, Nina, Nina, Nina. That ain't gonna help you, boy. You're so slow. You couldn't catch flies on the windshield. So we have a bit of an interaction, an interesting fight, uh, as always is the case when these two characters interact between Toad and Nightcrawler. They go back and forth with uh, Nightcrawler teleporting as his uh, his power uh, in and out uh, of Toad's way as Toad chases him up in and around the entire mansion. At one point, Toad is able to lay his hands on him, though, and at that point, uh, Professor X calls for the end of the recruitment test. Unfortunately, though, Nightcrawler accidentally teleports them uh, into a rather intimidating and perhaps deadly room that's right a dangerous room one might say for uh for <laughs> one the group here. but right, yes right. we get uh we get nightcrawler and toad uh, go in and immediately a bunch of mechanical uh, weaponry different giant sort of crane like devices as well as some laser cannons and things start going off and as uh as as Nightcrawler and Toad try to figure that out, Cyclops, aka Scott and Jean appear, and uh, they're in their full X outfits now too. We'll talk about that more in visuals, and they're all sort of uh, tangling with these uh, these various uh, d- uh, obstacles and and cannons and claw grab things, and uh, and then we see we see Xavier and Storm arrive in the uh, in the control room for this for this danger room and begin to uh sort of just see see exactly what the kids can do when left to their own devices and they hold their own for a bit although it's clear that as as it goes along they're not quite ready to uh to for prime time just yet so as uh, as Xavier begins to try to shut down the machine uh Nightcrawler jumps the gun a little bit and pulls the plug a little prematurely and another thing i think people uh, in the 90s and early 2000s thought would happen which is that if you unplug something before uh before shutting it down that it'll just go crazy <laughs> and, uh, and so the uh, the laser cannon that kurt tries to unplug uh, begins firing rapidly 
and uh, nearly uh, and in, in the process, Scott and uh, and Todd are both knocked back, and uh, and Todd's a little bit, uh, I would say, reasonably so, a little bit shaken up by this experience, and decides that he is uh, that this X Men thing is not for him, and he goes to make a hasty exit out of the uh, out of the school, but he happens to run into the. Uh, the uh, the man we saw at the gas station earlier it's Wolverine returning to the school and he seems like he's maybe going to threaten Todd or uh, or maybe try to detain him but uh, Xavier lets him know to just let Todd go and uh, and that uh, they'll uh, they'll see him again down the line and then uh, Logan and Xavier share a little bit of a of a kind word together as they establish that these are old friends who are uh, coming back together as, as Wolverine mentions that he smelled trouble and thought it was time for him to return home after some time away. And uh, we also get, uh, get Nightcrawler being very apologetic for the, the whole situation for the fight with Toad getting out of control. And uh, he actually says that he thinks he's not ready for the, uh, to join this team or this school and that he doesn't, uh, he doesn't belong there. Scott kind of goes to him and gives him a, a really nice pep talk as they find the uh, Chekhov's X jet or uh, the Blackbird as it's known. And Scott's sort of giving him the rundown of some of the cool technology they have at their disposal and, uh, and tells him that uh, though he did mess up a little bit in the toad fight, that, uh, that's what this school is all about and uh, that they're all going to learn together how to be better and how to control their powers and that uh, Nightcrawler is among friends here. So we, we see a little bit of, of Scott, even though he's, uh, he's still young, he hasn't grown into that archetypal team leader yet. We see that he, uh, he's already sort of building that rapport with his, uh, with his new teammates here. And, uh, and then we cut to like this fun little epilogue scene we have as, uh, as, Toad has returned to uh, to Principal Dark Holmes' office, and uh, she's absolutely furious with him. As uh, as we get some uh, a little bit of exposition, as she explains that not only did he run away despite being inside the uh, the inner workings, the inner sanctum of this Xavier Institute, before he could really uh, learn any of their secrets, but that uh, he wasted so much time leaving that Xavier was able to waste his uh, to wipe his mind. And so he doesn't really remember any of the specifics of what he saw there. Other than that, he, uh, he just knew he had to get out of there. So uh, Mystique shows him the door very, uh, very angrily. And as she begins to uh, show a little bit of her, uh, her temper and uh, transforms into her true form, the, the blue, the blue skin, the red hair. Uh, we hear a mysterious and ominous voice over her shoulder and uh, a lot of the metal objects in her office begin uh, floating around and circling around here as this voice tells her that she needs to calm down. Ah! Do not be so hard on the boy Mystique. We don't want to thin our ranks now, do we? Uh, no, sir. I'll be more careful. Mind you are. Uh, Remember, uh, this is only the beginning. And then we see a mysterious red-helmeted figure uh, appearing in the window behind Mystique. And uh, that's our fade to black for this pilot episode. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, before we... I guess talk about what we like, didn't like. I it, we always say this. Well, we've said this the last two years that we've done these uh, mm-hmm. these one offs uh, where we're reviewing something in a bubble where we purposefully picked the pilot episode because it's like, all right, if we were starting out doing a brand new podcast where we were reviewing this, this is where we would start. Um, right. So. I'm I'm just kind of thinking this as if I had seen this and I had not seen this episode in many, 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 many years. Um, if I was seeing this for the first time, would this hold my interest to want to come back as far as the plot is concerned? That's kind of like the, the idea that mm-hmm. I have here, but also you also have to look at it as, okay, it's an introduction has to be a a reboot or an introduction to a a myriad of characters here. So we have Scott and Jean who are introduced as characters, but they're 
they're already established on the show, so you don't get origin stories for them. Um, you really don't get any origin stories for most of anybody except for Kurt, kind of. You get, I mean, he's introduced, he's found to the show, but you don't learn about his backstory, the st- secrets of his past or how he came to be, uh, any of that stuff. So we don't really get any of that from any of the characters here. So you're you're getting introducing characters, but not giving origins, which is okay. I, I you I don't think you need every single pilot of a cartoon to be an origin story of a character. I don't think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the or the uh, the SpongeBob SquarePants uh, <laughs> pilot talks about his you know how how he became came to work at the Krusty Krab. Like I I, I doubt that that's how it that actually does. Does it? <laughs> You picked, the wrong, you picked the wrong one. No, the first episode is literally him getting his job at the Krusty Krab. Okay. I could have picked anything else, but I picked, yes. I picked him to pick that one. Yeah, you picked uh, the wrong one there. Is it, how about, I I doubt that it establishes how he and Patrick became friends. No, they are already friends. And okay, all right, stuff. all right. That's that's what I should have gone with. Maybe I'll edit that that first part out. But yeah, the so you have things that are already established part of canon that you can explore or figure out later if you so determine so too. And these characters, I think, are enough. I think they were going in with the idea that some people would understand enough or if the age, the target age group of six to 10 years old, they can figure it out on the fly. They don't need to know how, you know, Scott Summers discovered that he could shoot eye blasts. So you introduce these characters, what most of their powers are, without going back to square one. Um, actually, I think that superhero movies could use use to learn maybe a little bit from that. That said, um, I don't think that this episode is terribly interesting at any point. Um, mm-hmm. It's, you are, you have to establish sort of what the point of the X-Men, or I guess they decided they wanted to establish, like, what is the point of the X-Men? Like, what does Professor X do? Why are these kids going to boarding school here? Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to make it this missional thing where they're trying to recruit people so that that formula could kind of work going forward because you you know that the this crew eventually booms to a a giant x men size crew like you get a bunch of uh, recruits uh over these four seasons so um it's lacking in action which i think is a detriment to it but as far as pilot episodes and balancing all of that stuff that you have to do um i think they did an okay job i think the only thing and i think that this is this is interesting because it's clearly the same formula that marvel then capitalized on with their film division for the from 2009 to 2020 or whenever the the last successful marvel movie was <laughs> a truly successful marvel movie was um they did a really great job with that final scene and leaving it with a cliffhanger of oh shoot uh magneto is already being set up here we know he's the the greatest adversary of the of the x-men um Mm -hmm. but you also leave it enough of mystery for kids who don't know what's going on it it, you know who is this strange figure with the you know with the uh, shadowy face and this this weird looking helmet so i thought that that was pretty effective um you, you you don't bring him in right away he's sort of this shadowy figure that's that's uh you know uh, overshadowing the entire the entire part of the season. I don't know how how many episodes it takes for them to actually introduce the character, but he might be introduced on in the very next next episode for all I remember. But I think it's interesting because it it does set that up sort of like a a payoff for later on down the road. So it's it's interesting enough, but I I think it really other than the the scene with Scott versus the football players under the bleachers and um. I guess Nightcrawler and Toad kind of jumping around and then the, the danger room it's, there's not a ton of action sequences for a, for a superhero show. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, And we'll talk about what we, uh, what we do get in visuals in a minute here, but yes, it is a, it felt like a, and then show I would say is like, and then we meet this character and then this character shows up and then we see this guy watching this other guy. And then we meet this character and then they all get together in the final act and we get to the point. Um, yeah. Uh, the toad, 
I think is a really fun, like lackey character. And I'm, you know, I'm sure if you're a big fan of X-Men comics, there's probably been a ton of great toad based stories over the years, but uh, as a character that I know him as, which is from pri- primarily from this show and, you know, from the, the first live action uh, movie, uh, he's kind of a background player. So him being like the, the it's not, he's not really the villain because they don't fight him. Um, so yeah, I think there's not, there's not like a central, a central antagonist for the episode. Obviously, like you said, that's being set up with uh, principal mystique and, and the, the, shadow of magneto which i think kind of hangs over this entire first season um and they had they had i guess wanted to do something where it introduced everything and introduced the concept of mutants and introduced all of the main mutants powers and some t- and they do that in some creative ways like we said the you know the bit where wolverine without what while well, the guy is looking slices the top off his water bottle or or you said like storm uh watering the plants or whatever they do some creative stuff with it i think I think that opening scene where Scott's glasses come off and the idea of like, wow, if this gets out of control, people are going to die. Like you have that feeling. It's a pretty, mm-hmm. I think a pretty strong opening. Mm-hmm. And I think that final scene in uh, principal mystique's office where we get the, you know, the specter of Magneto hanging over things, both very good, like really good bookends and in the middle, it's like, well, we meet we meet Nightcrawler and we meet Scott and Jean a little bit and we meet Professor X and we meet Storm and we meet Wolverine. And yeah, we just we just meet a lot of characters and then get told Saber what their powers Tooth. are. Oh, yeah, and then Saber- Sabretooth is there. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, he's he's hanging out. Uh, he's, he's around. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's just a lot of introduce a new character. And then we give a little explanation of what their powers are. And then we meet another new character and we just kind of go through. And then, yes, they have that final bit where we get a little bit of like a toad, toad night crawler budding rivalry and, and they fight through the mansion and fight into the danger room. And that's all kind of fun and, 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 and feels, you know, it's, it's fun, but it's kind of low stakes. I don't, I don't hate it, but yeah, that being like the big third act uh, resolution. Um, and also like night crawler, like, is gonna quit the team because like i mean like toad's <laughs> toad's pretty aggressive when he gets there like it's right. not like i mean he's kind of taunting him and egg- i guess nightcrawler's kind of taunting him and egg- egging him on but i don't i don't know i thought again it does it does allow for that nice little moment which again i know is another one of the 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 big uh like kind of little brother big brother relationships between scott and kurt that they set up kind of in this episode so again i know this is a lot of building blocks for i think better episodes and better moments in the series Mm -hmm. and sometimes maybe you do need to sacrifice you know the big action set pieces or or you know big big uh, bombastic finales to to make those building blocks i just wonder if like for a like you said if we're thinking about this as a pilot episode this isn't like lighting the world on fire but then again you think about it and it's like well the pilot episode or at least the first episode produced of batman is an episode where the first time we see batman he's sitting in a chair reading a newspaper (laughs) uh and and then you know he fights man bat he doesn't fight the joker or penguin or 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 whatever obviously the first televised one has catwoman but it introduces a villain nobody's ever heard of in red claw so it's like i i guess you could probably if you really wanted to you could make that argument about almost any of these these shows we've talked about but yeah we don't get like an archetypal like classic x-men versus the brotherhood or x-men versus the juggernaut or one of their big kind of classic villains we meet a lot of their their classic villains and a lot of the classic x-men characters but then there's like all right we're gonna play around in the danger room for a couple minutes because we need to have some explosions and then we're going to just set every. We're just going to kick the can down the road and join us next week when we, we can learn a little bit more about uh, these, uh, these new characters and these new version of the X-Men. So like I said, if I was, if I was them, I'd be like, you need to premiere like the first two episodes. I think this is one of those shows. If it went to streaming now, mm-hmm. you put up like the first two or three episodes. Cause if you just put up this one, people will be like, wait, that's it. <laughs> Mm, right so yeah and again television was a different medium at the time people were maybe more patient 
<laughs> what they got. But like you said, you just think of like when you think of a pilot episode for an animated cartoon, you just expect maybe a more big bombastic thing. And for better or worse, the the producers and writers on this show decided they wanted to do a bit more of a slow burn. Yeah, I think they relied on maybe a well leaning into the desire for kids or your audience to say, well, I want to know what happens next. I want to know about who is that guy in the tree or who is that guy with the mask or, you know, what's, who's the person they're going to recruit next? Like that, it's almost like that desire to see what happens next was what they were trying to lean into versus let's, let's give them something to appreciate for this episode. And I guess it, it's different in that this series um you know is a is a overarching story um you know it's not obviously there are plots and stuff like that 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 don't uh you know start or aren't covered in every single episode or that continue throughout the uh throughout the series but you introduce this character of of magneto at the end of the series and make him or at the end of this episode and you know make him a mystery and um memory if mem- my memory serves me correctly a lot of this season is both teams both the brotherhood and the x-men recruiting people so you get you get the brotherhood building their team which is secretly being led by mystique who's being led by magneto so it's sort mm-hmm. of like a puppet regime so you do have that building towards something over these episodes but um it's not like batman the animated series which obviously was the same characters in every episode, but wasn't necessarily, you wouldn't get references to past episodes. You didn't need to watch every single episode. Um, you know, it wasn't one continuous story uh, from the beginning to end. So I guess in a way that's, that's a little bit different than, than how this is, is handled. So I guess in some ways you need to give an incentive for someone to continue watching uh, if you're going to be doing, you know, telling a, a long-term story over the entire season. So um, for all those reasons, I mean, I think we talked about at the beginning of, of our, of our episode here, both of us, I, I have not watched this series in many, many, many <laughs> Many years i think i went back maybe during covid and attempted to watch an episode and i was like uh, i think i probably tried to watch something an episode in the middle of it and i was like yeah i'm, I'm not really digging this um but obviously we loved it when we were growing up you know it's yeah. something that we we both enjoyed so i would be interested in revisiting additional episodes uh perhaps on my own time in the future to see an overall opinion of it but uh, as far as this episode in a vacuum, my first impression in many, many years of watching this going, oh, I'm not sure that this is enough for me to give it a, a a giant score of like approval. So I ended up giving it just uh just middle of the road, five out of 10 when it came to plot. What about you? Yeah, I went six out of 10. I think uh, I don't I don't disagree with a lot of uh, what you said. Obviously, like I said, it's a it's a real slow burn and it's a lot of exposition. It's a lot of introducing all of the characters. Um, but I think, yeah, I think I really, I think that opening is really striking. I think the ending is really, really good. Um, and I think, like I said, I think you do get, as, as you said, especially with the producers working under some constraints on how explicit they could be. I think there is a, you know, you get the heart of what an X-Men story needs to be. It's about, like you said, it's about inclusion. It's about, you know, people belonging, no matter what they look like or, you know, what they can, what, uh, what gifts they may have, or even if other people don't understand them. Um, so I think they, they managed to fit that in and, and, uh, you know, the scenes with, with Scott, like Scott and Jean don't, blink like they don't there's like a little bit of a moment where when you when you do the curt reveal we can talk about it in visuals when you see that he's this you know blue guy with a tail and everything where you think there's going to be like the giant recoil reaction but you really don't get that so you do get the sense that oh this is this is a safe place for all of these for all of these people to be even for someone like kurt who has more of a you know a physical mutation that it's a lot harder to keep under wraps than uh than laser eyes or miss telekinesis you know so it's uh i think that's i think they they managed to fit in what i feel like is a pretty essential element of of the x-men as well so like i said i think there's there's a lot better offerings in the series from a story perspective but again maybe those get to be better because this these uh this 
first or first or two, one or two episodes do a lot of that heavy lifting as far as introducing all these characters and concepts. All right, well, let's move on to our next category, which is going to be animation and visuals. And um, I saw DR Movie Co. was responsible for some of the animation on this series. Uh, who did this episode? Did you notate that during so our... It's called, uh, Madhouse Incorporated, I believe, is the particular studio credited with this episode. Um, they worked on a lot of... Uh, a lot of anime products, more Eastern animation. They even worked with like Studio Ghibli, who's of course one of the, or Ghibli, if I'm mispronouncing that, uh, one of the big uh, animation studios uh, that did like My Neighbor Totoro, which is one that this Madhouse uh, Animation House worked on, um, as well as more recently, something like The Boy and the Heron, which I believe just won an Oscar. So um, yeah, they they certainly have a a pretty high pedigree of work. They also worked on some of the, later uh later 2000s direct to video marvel animation like the uh the hulk versus wolverine and a few of those other ones that the, the that marvel produced um so i i think this one you can definitely tell you can definitely tell that this is an easter uh, a studio an animation studio that uh that has a, a, a works more in the eastern animation field but a uh, credit to our director, Frank Parr, as we said, veteran of Batman, the animated series, other Warner Brothers animation uh, projects uh, coming over here. And as we've talked about with friend of the show, Kevin Altieri and Dan Reba before, uh, I think this director knew how to play to the strengths of uh, of what our uh, of what our studio could and couldn't do. Mm-hmm. And, and like there's a lot of close-ups like the, the when we were kind of first introduced to scott i mean at first we just kind of see him sitting on the bleachers playing with a quarter but when we we get the the reveal where he walks in and he's kind of encased in shadow and we get this like the sheen across his his you know his bright red glasses um that a lot of like really really detailed close-ups and a lot of interesting works where like f- like faces are obstructed by shadow or or something like that. I feel like there's a lot of uh, like close-ups and things like that, a lot of reactions and, and things like that. I feel like that's one of the things that I picked up on right away. Yeah, I noticed that too. Lots of lots of interesting facial expressions. Uh, there's a really cool shot um, of the reflection in Scott's glasses too, uh, where I think, I don't think it's, is it the scene underneath the, I don't think it's the scene. I think it's the scene where they're in the school um, when, Toad and and him are talking when he's sort of doing the recruitment speech in the um, uh, next to the lockers. You get the reflection off of mm-hmm. Scott's glasses and that. I thought that was really awesome. And even with <laughs> Toad's disgusting slime hanging off of the sunglasses, uh, it, it just it was pretty striking. Um, they did a couple of things. Uh, Scott under the bleachers. He's in he's in shadow uh, for the first little bit as he's talking. You only see sort of the the outline of his glasses and most of his face is in shadow. You get a little bit of highlight uh, on the side of his face, but really, really interesting uh, choices there. I think the 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 BAMF, uh, I'm going to call it the BAMF effect that uh, mm-hmm. that Nightcrawler has. I thought that was that was done really, really well. Um, you know, I, I, I guess you just stop drawing the characters, how you make that effect happen. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I liked that. I thought that the transitions of him jumping around in and out of, uh, you know, t- teleporting from place to place, uh, looked very, uh, w- interesting. I think that whole sequence of him and Toad sort of doing battle, chasing around the mansion and, uh, jumping in, him jumping in and out of dimension, and then ultimately him and uh, Toad going out of dimension and then back into dimension in, in the danger room. I thought that was great. I think the backgrounds look pretty good too. A lot of painted backgrounds uh, for the scenes. Uh, the introduction of the the X Jet uh, completely, you know, painted with them animated in and around it. I thought it looked looked pretty strong. Um, liked that. I I did note by the way. So this. This show was being developed during the filming of the original X-Men live action film. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, much like Batman, the animated series, the cartoon was asked to have some somewhat, uh, synergistic, um, in, to be synergistic in appearance and and uh, some of the characterizations that they did, but mm-hmm. also like Batman the animated series, from what I read, the issue was is that uh, 
things were kept under lock and key during the filming. So nobody <laughs> knew what the characters looked like. It was like pulling teeth to try and get information. But uh, the aforementioned very normal fella, Avi Arad, was uh, <laughs> apparently a producer on both the live action film and was obviously working on the production of this show as well. Uh, so uh, he was able to give them some insights, but very few. The uh, According to uh, Boyd Kirkland's uh, couple of in, one of the interviews that I saw, uh, they gave gave uh, some tips kind of on what Sabretooth looked like. Uh, they gave some insight on what uh, Logan's hair looked like, which is why mm. he has a similar hair shape, uh, but uh, very little. And Oh, and Professor X's wheelchair. <laughs> All of those oh. things uh, you, would you look get sim- the X wheels. So yes, he, he did. Yep. I did notice that, that uh, that's what kind of uh, drew me to that. I was like, Oh, I wonder if they knew uh, if, if they were, you know, sharing some of the, the, the live action did that, mm-hmm. you know, to, to appear to uh, as much as they could as the live action film. But uh, yeah, the truth is they didn't have many resources to, uh, to do it. So they weren't able to, to do very much, which again, as we mentioned was, uh, was, was a similar, a similar thing that happened with uh, the ask for Batman, the animated series. So very interesting there, but um, <laughs> it noted uh, I, almost everywhere that I, that I uh, looked at also is the fact that mystiques change uh, look changes from season to season. Um, mm-hmm. This original design was not one that anybody on the show apparently was a fan of, uh, <laughs> but uh, they also could not do her uh, without clothes as she was in the live action yeah. film. Um, and uh, they they kind of tweaked her design as the, the series went along. So uh, character designs, the suits are certainly uh, recreations. They are not the uh the typical designs that you would see in the the classic comics or even the previous x-men uh the animated series cartoon i i love these suits they're sleek they're cool i think cyclops's suit um might be my favorite version it's it's sort of like his original suit that had the hood on it so it's got the x across the chest in that similar vein but he's got those really cool shoulder pikes with the X logos on them. Yes. Um, just a really sleek design. And then going down to the golden boots and the gold, you know, of course the gold gloves, um, everybody kind of looks like they're on the same team too. So everybody has a little bit of gold someplace on their, on their uniform. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kurt, uh, suit as we mentioned i think typically in the comics he has white gloves and white boots with that that similar look with the red red vest with the shoulder things uh but this they ended up giving him the gold gloves and the the gold boots so um again just kind of making it look like a like a one team a unif- uniform look yeah. for everybody yeah and uh jean uh who we only briefly see suited up but she has her suit is is pretty uniform with Scott's, but she also has like a little splash of green in her suit, which I assume would be a reference to the the Phoenix costume. So, or or maybe I think there's a couple of her like Marvel Girl, which was her other alter ego in the in the comics. I think I think one or two of her other suits have green in them too. So they fit in fit in those dashes and homages. Yeah, it feels much again like a Batman anime series. It feels totally archetypal classic without it being a direct recreation of a specific suit uh, from the comics, like, uh, like the 90s show uh, did with the, with the Jim Lee X-Men designs. Yeah. So I, I really adore these designs. I think the characters themselves, once they're suited up, we do get a lot of scenes in this episode, something else maybe they should have thought about. You get a lot of the the characters out of costume and, Mm-hmm. Then I guess that let leads to not having much action uh, in the in the episode because it's a lot of dialogue and stuff happening at the high school. But again, they wanted to establish that these these characters are all teenagers and uh, they're all they're all hanging out at high school where they belong. So um, yeah, I I, I love uh, the Professor X looks looks faithful. You know who you can look at every character and you know who they are right away just by looking at them. Like it is not mm-hmm. it is not, but it it is done in a way that it is it is its own style. I think, I think the funniest thing is Logan's cowboy persona. Um, you know, it's his, his walking around with his cowboy <laughs> hat. We don't get a Wolverine suit up for the episode. He's only obviously in, in uh, two very short scenes uh, that we get of him. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, we, we do know of course that he ends up suiting up and has his own sort of amalgamation of, uh, of different looks uh, based on, on past mm-hmm. appearances. So um, yeah, overall, I, 
I I think because the episode lacks from a a true strong action sequence of of heroes versus villains fighting, I struggled to find a a lot to to heap praise on. But I think um, you know the character designs lead lead the way as far as the 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 look of the show. Uh, I mentioned it at the top. It's always funny to me to watch. Um, obviously most of the animation that's done in the shows that we watch is typically done in Japan, uh, which are, are not, not likely, or in some cases, Korea, uh, not likely familiar with the game of American football. So to have them animate a sequence that involves action taking place in football is always, always funny to me. Because it never looks anything like actual football uh, would look like, you know, on if to the uh, to the to the viewer with knowledge. So, um, yeah, very very funny. By the way, that uh, that is pretty hilarious. Uh, you want to talk briefly about uh, Mystique's transformation into that freaky looking monster thing? Oh yeah, it's just it's it's so funny because we don't we don't see her actual Mystique form until literally the you know, the last. 30 seconds of the episode or whatever so as far as we know her true form is this it's like this giant purple i was trying to figure out if this was a specific thing like from x-men lore or marvel lore that they snuck in here mm-hmm. which kind of looks like a xenomorph from uh the aliens movie agreed that's what i thought purple and has like big big uh big white teeth um so not an exact uh for a legally distinct version of a xenomorph but uh and uh yeah i wasn't sure if this was also, maybe a little bit like there's a, a villain called Shadow King, um, who his mm. uh, his uh, dream he's like a mutant that gets into people's dreams, uh-huh. and he has this kind of weird uh, toothy monster look. So I don't know if I don't know if this was pulling on a specific uh, specific string there, or maybe uh, maybe it's just the uh, the aliens homage. We know folks that worked on Batman the Animated Series would often pull from uh from cinematic influences but yes she just turns into this crazy monster and uh, it's it's a fun little scene even her voice kind of changes so you kind of set up uh they do a lot of cool things with mystique's shape-shifting in this series from memory so that's a fun little taste only other thing i will mention is we were we already talked about the uniforms a lot i think this also owes a lot to the ultimate x-men uh comic book that was probably starting around this time as well I think this started in one, so this might actually predate it slightly. But uh, as far as I think, as as far as the, when as the show went on, because it was a lot of this where it wasn't so stripped down like the movie costumes, where it's just black leather and maybe you get a little bit of color on the accents or something. But it was this very uniform, like everyone's in like dark blue and and yellow or gold uh, costumes and things like that. So I, I noted the similarities there. I'm not sure if there was uh, any coinciding here or if perhaps even the show maybe uh uh it inspired in part the uh the the comic book as well um but they would have been in production around the same time so i uh, wanted to mention that but yeah i think overall i i like the look of this show like you said it's hard to rate it in motion because there isn't a lot of acting i uh, action i think there is a lot of fun like we said they they really pull a lot of uh, like over the top reaction faces and things like that toad the toad design of toad's weird like egg costume that he's in that's just a weird little design but i i like it a lot um i think that that's pretty fun uh as well there so like overall i ended up giving visuals a seven out of ten i think i i just i like the look of this show a lot i like that it's a little bit stronger in its uh eastern animation influences i would say in uh, in the way it, uh, it it sort of lingers on shots and uh, and that and then my last note you already mentioned how funny some of the football stuff is I love that the guys go and put on their helmets before they go to menace toad <laughs> they're like they take their helmets off they're talking on the sidelines they look over they see toad and they're like hey coach can we be excused and then they're like they're like all right let's go be bullies and they go they all like in unison put their helmets on and then they go to to menace poor Todd. So I, I, I thought that was a really funny little bit as well. Very funny. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I ended up giving animation visuals a six out of 10. Um, yeah, I, I would vote. The only thing I'll, I'll add to that is, uh, based on the uniforms is, uh, since we know that they're doing X-Men live action now, I think 
you can just go ahead and do yellow spandex and just, yes. <laughs> oh, but we know that they, for whatever reason, for the longest time, uh, Hollywood has been against putting heroes in common accurate costumes. So if you're going to mm-hmm. do something different, do this, do a dark with a, yeah. with a, a yellow accent or a gold accent or something like that. It's uh, these costumes are super sleek and I, I love them, love them to death. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, that that X around the chest on Cyclops is, is just like so iconic to me. Like, it's so it's... cool, so cool. It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. All right, Liam, let's move on to our next category, which is going to be music. And music this week is done by one William Anderson, according to the credits. Uh, got anything? Uh, any factoids about Mister Anderson? Any any information about uh, his previous career work? Yeah, um, in addition to working on uh, quite a few, uh, quite a few other animated soundtracks, including things like My Little Pony, some uh, some younger children's animation, I would say, um, and also for some adults as well. <laughs> please, don't, please, don't, <laughs> please don't attack me, Bronies. Mm. But uh, is that a thing still? Let me know. Let me know we, if Bronies are still a thing. That we've a angered thing. the Bronies. <laughs> Let me know how. <laughs> how much reverence I should still have for bronies, but I should mention he also did a few, uh, a few feature films, including uh kiss, kiss, bang, bang, a very good uh, Robert Downey Jr. And Shane black film from the, the two thousands yeah. worked on, uh, worked on the uh, crypto, the super dog animated show as well. And, uh, and also the short lived MTV computer generated uh, Spider-Man cartoon. That uh, sort of coincided with the the first Tobey Maguire movie, um, so that's uh, that's that's his credit there. I was pleasantly surprised because I expected just like either stock uh, music or I think of that Spider Man show where there's just <laughs> constantly like walls elev- of music, walls of elev- like elevator music playing constantly in that. Um, but one, I guess we should kick off with the theme song, also uh, also composed by. Uh, by mr anderson here um look nothing is gonna be as far as an x-men theme song i will admit the nine the 1992 series theme rules all of course like there's there's a reason that that's the one that when they when they rolled out uh, uh patrick stewart in the doctor strange movie a couple years ago they played that theme like there's a reason for that that's for sure. that's one of the most iconic superhero themes ever but i do think this is a pretty good like 2000s high energy opening and you have that composed with the visuals most of it i think are just clips from the show i don't think there's much original animation other than maybe the final shot where nightcrawler lands in front of the whole team but um but yes that that opening theme song uh i as soon as it started i knew i knew like every note i knew i knew exactly where the theme song was going so i do have a, a special place in my heart for the theme song right off the bat yeah it is uh it's hard to uh it, in the same way it, to to follow up how do you follow a legend like mm-hmm. you don't you you just can't um you know nobody remembers the the guy that that replaced uh you know Babe Ruth or Lou Gehrig in most cases mm-hmm. or named the legend you know um however uh because we like this show this song rules um the other <laughs> the the X-Men 97 theme absolutely is the king of X-Men themes there's no doubt uh however this would get uh this would get runner up as like uh you know most most underappreciated or most undervalued or best bestest looking <laughs> i don't know <laughs> theme something <laughs> uh so yeah the theme the theme rules uh it's good it's solid I didn't particularly love most of the other music in the episode. I think in a way, like you said, it was pleasantly surprising not just to have a barrage of music from start to finish, which is what our exposure to most of the music from those 90s Marvel cartoons were, uh, which was not pleasant nor enjoyable for anyone both then or now. So for them not to do that. I appreciated there are downbeats. There are times where the music is quiet. Um, there was, uh, I think the, the 
music at the beginning during the fight sequence with the underneath of the bleachers was fine. Um, it's hard also to identify. Is there a, a theme for each character? Is there, this is the first episode and the only episode we've watched in, I don't know, decades. So are any of these themes going to come back and, and there are a couple that I definitely like storm definitely has a theme. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's almost like a little bit of a choir that comes in. I don't know. I, I assume that's created by like a keyboard or synthesizer, but mm-hmm. like it has this very ethereal tone to it. And I think mystique also, as, as I recognize that and Ma- Magneto does as well, for sure. So I think we get little tastes of it, but none of them are like on screen doing anything for long enough. Right. For us Which to is... get a full taste of it. Right. And it is, uh, as we said, it's, it's hard to judge these things in such a, a vacuum and a limited exposure that we have, uh, when we're doing a, a review of it. So, um, there was one sequence where in the danger room, there was just a weird, I wrote down weird circus music. It was like, it just <laughs> so out of place. It was, I don't know what it, again, I, I feel like this is probably all keyboards. Um, but it was some just weird, plinky, plunky, weird sounding music that seemed completely out of place for what the sequence was that was occurring on the screen. So I, I did not care for that. Um, but then I, I felt like the, the conversation that Scott and, and Kurt had was also punctuated by, uh, uh, you know, some nice, nice background, soft mm-hmm. encouragement. You know, this guy's taking the lead on this thing, um, type of, type of, uh, theme. So, uh, overall, I settled on a five out of 10 for music. Uh, again, I didn't think there was anything that, uh, blew me away. Um, maybe one thing that I was like, what is that? But overall, yeah, hard, hard to judge music as a, as a negative or a positive on, uh, in a vacuum like this. Yeah. I went a couple points higher. I went seven out of 10. Um, I, I liked, I liked what I heard. Um, like I said, I think we didn't, we didn't get enough of those character themes to really appreciate them. And my, maybe my score would have been even higher. Um, my, my one big note that I, that I, I definitely, uh, had in my notes was the, uh, just after Scott has unleashed his power for the first time and knocked Duncan back and blown up the protein and we're kind of seeing the aftermath of it. And, you know, we cut and we, and we kind of, the camera moves behind Scott and we see that he's watching all of this and man, we just start shredding on an electric guitar. Like we just go ham on like, (laughs) like it's, it's like a white snake solo all of a sudden. (laughs) It's, it's really almost out of nowhere and kind of made me laugh a little bit. So I, I appreciated that the moody electric guitar, uh, of of scott summers uh made made me laugh a lot and of course like we said the 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 main theme song uh uh, electric i love it so uh yeah thumbs up for the music there you go all right let's wrap things up here with our final category of the week which of course is going to be voice acting Uh, let's go ahead and talk about our voice cast here and uh, discuss if there's any crossover or notable appearances from people that we might uh might recognize that's right. So uh, definitely some familiar voices. I didn't necessarily uh, cop too many uh, immediate DCAU uh, crossovers, but uh, playing playing the voice of Toad, we have Noel Fisher, who, uh, in addition to a lot of voice acting, was on uh, on the show Shameless for several years. I I don't know what accent he's trying to do. I think I think Toad is British in the comics. And this feels like New back. York for sure, right? Brooklyn. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess he's trying to do like. Yeah, he's he's like Red Hook, Red Hook, uh, Brooklyn, <laughs> type type uh, type guy. Like he's yeah, but it's 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 a little bit over the top and and cartoony. But I mean, I feel like there's the the character design. It ma- the voice matches the character design. I think. Okay. All right. That's fair. Yeah. 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 He's goofy. He's the smelly character. I don't know. I lost count how many times they talk about the fact that he stinks. That's like the recurring thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he he gives no f's and uh, it doesn't give an f about nothing. And uh, he's just <laughs> kind of this goofy oddball, supposed to be the outcast character, right? That's what that's what the Brotherhood ends up being is all these outcasts that uh, that end up ganging up together to to fight the x-men so uh it's fine it's a fine he's 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 an annoying character in this series and he, the voice fits it i feel absolutely um elsewhere in the show we'll talk about some of our minor players first we have colleen wheeler as mystique 
Um, I think she has a very imposing uh, presence to her. We don't get a lot of her here. Um, I do think it's a really quirky, funny idea that Mystique is the principal at the X-Men school. I just think <laughs> that's a funny idea in general. I don't know if we mentioned that when we were talking about the plot, but I just, I've always thought that's such a, such a like funny bit. <laughs> like, cause every, every teenager thinks the principal or their teacher or whoever, whoever the, the stern authority figure is, is, you know, is the devil. And this one, you know, almost literally is. So it's a, it's a fun <laughs> bit of a, a fun bit here, I think, to have Mystique be the villain. But yeah, she's she's pretty imposing and uh, and uh, and and dramatic. They put some kind of voice effect when she does the weird alien transformation, but I think she's uh, in, in a limited role. She definitely uh, she definitely has an imposing uh, force in this episode. No, uh, yeah, we don't get a ton from her, obviously, just but there are two very impactful scenes that she has, and she does feel very much like a threat. Um, she she feels like the villain of the show, somebody that uh, that you should be afraid of, which is interesting because she then is sort of reduced to the lackey by the by the uh, booming voice of uh, of Magneto in the final scene too. So uh, I think that works to the the story that you're trying to tell there that she's obviously quite the badass and someone to be uh to be afraid of but also she there's an even bigger boss maybe even a final boss if you will absolutely crossover uh but uh yeah i think uh, i think she does a great job and speaking of that booming uh, magneto voice which we really only get for about 15 seconds at the end of the episode that is the voice of christopher judge um, most recently, I think folks would know him. He's the the modern voice of Kratos in the God of War series, the huh. uh, the PlayStation games. He's took over that role, and the, those series have kind of changed from being these really. I'm going to get in trouble because people that love those original games will say I'm I'm undervaluing them. <laughs> but these kind of boilerplate hack and slash aggression simulators into a, a much more sort of cerebral and stoic uh, and interesting character. Um, and uh, Mr. Judge does a great job there. I think he also does some writing for, uh, as well as, uh, as well as his work as an actor, but, oh yeah, he's a, he's a great spooky, uh, spooky Magneto voice, a big, big boss uh, voice to have show up at the end to let you know that something bigger and better is on its way. Sorry, I'm over here just keeping track of the fans that we've pissed off so far. The Bronies, Bronies the original God, God of Wars, God of Wars. I feel like there was another fan base. Oh, I think X Men: The Animated Series, yeah, the original, original X Men Animated Series, because yep. I said the better show <laughs> in every um, way. Yeah, just remember, send all <laughs> of your hate, all of your hate to Liam, and cool. uh, he runs our social media pages. No, I'm just kidding. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, it's an intimidating voice to say the least. I think there's a little bit of effect <laughs> that they put on it uh, at the end there, but certainly terrifying accompanied by that faceless image of the floating mirage of Magneto. Uh, you, you, very intimidating. I don't know how the mirage appeared there. That's obviously not one of his powers. I was hoping that it was like he made the image out of like paper clips or something like that. <laughs> but but uh yeah I, I don't think it's ever explained how that uh that floating mirage of his uh showed up there but hey uh the voice is what we're talking about and yeah it's it's a very brief moment there but very impactful and as i stated in our uh in our plot synopsis it's what would have brought me back as far as piquing my interest of like hey i i kind of want to know what happens you know when magneto ends up showing up here so uh yeah i think that 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 alone gives it uh, credibility as far as being an effective voice absolutely and uh, also we have uh, venus terzo as Jean Grey, another veteran voice actor, and also some live action stuff. She's she's the psychiatrist on Arrow, who shows ah. up, I think, in some of the. I think she just she's one of those characters that just pops up from time to time. Uh, I think she, I, she's another one of those. I think you might you might know her face if you saw her, because um, she's in like I think she's in like ten or fifteen, like ten or twelve episodes of of that that Arrow series, but. Um, yeah, as Jean, we don't get much for for her as far as her her motivations, other than that, uh, she she makes all the boys crazy. It's clear um, <laughs> as uh, as both Duncan and uh, and Scott are are uh, clearly interested in her. But uh, yeah, we don't get much. We you know she's she's nice to uh, to Kurt. We see that, but we don't really get a uh, much of a. It's not much of a showcase for her. 
Yeah, she's uh she's sort of a supporting character, as you mentioned. Uh the star is really, you know, we'll talk about with between between our next couple of characters. So uh not much to write home about, but certainly nothing offensive or or poor on her uh performance uh, worth noting. Absolutely, yeah. Also if you'll mention uh, Kirsten Alter as Storm slash Aurora. Uh yeah, she's she's good. She has that sort of like uh maternal teacher uh vibe that I think they're going with with her being one of the the uh uh older older uh uh or adults, I should say, one of the adults yeah. at the uh, at the school helping uh Charles train this new generation of music of mutants uh again we don't get a lot from her but yeah you get that sense that she's very she's a bit stoic she's a bit uh she has this maternal instinct and uh and and all that we get and we get to see her a little bit in action with uh with uh, trying to strike toad with lightning which uh depending on who you ask maybe that leaked from the the movie set that they were going to do a an iconic showdown between storm and toad in the live action movie and so they had to uh to add that in here as well well, I was going to ask you if you know what happens to a toad when it gets struck by lightning, uh, but it appears that you already know the answer to that question. And that is that uh, that the same thing that happens to anything else that gets struck by lightning, right? Uh, yeah. If anything, if there's anything that that Brian Singer, uh, rest in piss, that guy taught us <laughs> was uh, that uh, that toads get struck by lightning just like anybody else. But anyway, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's it's you got to have more adults than just Professor X uh, hanging out at the mansion. You got to have a matronly figure here. You got the weird got, Professor X is the weird grandpa. And then you got you got Logan, who's the dad and uh, and uh, and Storm gets to be the mom. So uh, she plays clearly a, a great friendly supporting character to Professor X in the episode. Not a ton for her to do. Uh, there's more episodes down the line that she gets to star in, but uh, yeah, uh, same thing that I would say as far as Jean is concerned, nothing offensive, nothing that I felt stood out as a positive or a negative or, or a negative rather. So uh, I'll go ahead and give it a positive review for her, her performance. Absolutely. And then we have a uh, Brad Swale or Swale, Swale. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that playing uh, Nightcrawler slash Kurt Wagner. Uh, folks who know him, a lot of uh, English dubs of various uh, Japanese a- anime cartoons, as uh, as we uh, already mentioned, all of the anime influence in the Eastern studios that they're working uh, with, uh, Dragon Ball, uh, Mobile Suit Gundam, a lot of the, I think a lot of the, like the meat and potatoes uh, animes, I would call them. Uh, this guy did a lot of work on those uh, those English dubs of those. I like him as I like him as Nightcrawler. He's got that really. He's very. He has to. He probably gets the the biggest like emotional arc of this episode, and that he's very timid and feels that like he's out of place. And then he he gets the suit and he gets his uh you know his hologram watch, and so he's kind of feeling a little bit cocky, a little bit uh, a little bit full of himself. And then when he kind of screws up things with uh, in the danger room. Then he kind of has that uh, that moment where he comes back down to earth, and and Scott has to kind of cheer him up. So he probably gets the most to do as far as having to portray a variety of emotions in the episode. Yeah, um, I think to various degrees. I, I don't know if it's the <laughs> accent um, or or what, because I don't think it's a natural accent. If I had to guess, uh, it seems like he's putting that on a little bit. It just. <laughs> I don't buy the emotion that he gives a lot of the time. And it, it just kind of feels like he gives the same cadence for a lot of the delivery uh, for the lines that he has. So I was not blown away by his performance. I think the best scene certainly is the back and forth between him and Scott, that scene that we've mentioned a couple of times now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that he quickly becomes a character who comes out of his shell. Like it's interesting that you're intro- you're introduced to him as this character that's wearing this giant cloak that's hiding, that's afraid to you know even extend his hand to to uh, to to Scott for fear of being rejected, and he does not stay there very long as he quickly becomes very comfortable with his own appearance, interacting with Toad, and then as we know, he's sort of the class clown and the goofball. Uh, character that uh that kind of it's weird he's kind of like the beast boy for this team not in the same way like beast boy and the teen (laughs) titans but it's the similar like sometimes he's the comic relief sometimes he's just the you know the light-hearted take for the for the heavier scene so uh 
I don't think that this was a great showcase of that. Again, I think I found that most of the lines were delivered with a similar cadence, which it felt like it should be a little bit heavier or he should be showing a little bit more lack of confidence at certain points. But uh, I, I do think that the scene with Scott was, was, uh, was good enough for me to say it was a, Maybe maybe not his best performance, but there was uh, certainly signs there that there could be some better performances down the road. Absolutely. And then uh, go through our last few X-Men here. We do have Scott McNeil as uh, as Logan, a.k.a. Wolverine. And uh, uh, I, li- I like him as Wolverine. Folks, again, would know him. He's done a lot of work, voice acting work on things like Dragon Ball, some of the various Transformers animated series. Um, yeah, I, I think he does a good job. Again, we don't get a ton with him. This is a, this is again another more to come character, like with Mister Judge's Magneto. But uh, he's got that uh, again. I think that putting him in the cowboy hat was a good like. Uh, they knew what they were doing with this version of, of Wolverine. Like he's a he's the <laughs> kind hearted outlaw coming coming back to his old stopping grounds. Uh, I was going to say that the scene where he comes up and and talks to to Toad. We didn't talk about in visuals, but certainly some dirty Harry Clint Eastwood mm-hmm. homage is there with him tipping up the hat. And uh, he doesn't quite go so far as to say, are, are you feeling lucky, punk? But I felt like that could have come out of his mouth at that point. So, um, yeah, I, one of the th- interesting things that uh, was also unsurprisingly difficult for the showrunners to balance here was taking a character who is known for his uh his violence to say the least i think the the description that i saw from uh, mr kirkland was this is a character who wakes up every single morning and chooses violence uh so (laughs) how do you put that character into a an animated show for kids uh and still adhere to the you know the standards and practices that you're being required to uphold so um for this version of the character, you still have him being pretty aggressive, obviously, in the uh, in the in the convenience store where he slices the top of the bottle off. But he doesn't get much to do for the episode. Again, there's more episodes down the line where we get to hear him share more emotion. But it's a fine it's a fine introduction to the character. And uh, he and Charles's interactions, I think, were were good enough to lay groundwork for uh, for more down the line. Absolutely. And then uh, wrapping things up or coming back to our, our final two here, we do have uh, Kirby Morrow as uh, Cyclops, a.k.a. Scott Summers, the late Kirby Morrow, unfortunately, died, died very young um, back in back in 2020. Um, another guy who did a lot of uh, work, voice acting work and, and things like uh, in Ayusha and uh, several other animes was working, I think, right up until when he did uh, did pass away. Um, yeah, this is this is the voice of Scott Summers to me. If I, uh, you know, if I if I were to read a, an X Men comic, this is this is the voice I'm hearing. Like this, he's uh, he very much embodied this character to me, and in, in and in a way of like seeing this this guy who is often portrayed as the super uptight, like by the book, you know, teacher's pet guy before he's really in that role. I think he he gets he gets to do. Again, we we don't get a ton because so much of it is about introducing other new characters. <laughs> but I I do like what we hear from Mister Morrow in this episode. Yeah, it's uh, it's it is certainly a shame that uh, he passed away so so young. Um, you know, he he did have a a bit of a live action career as well, and um, not only a lot of like one character appearances and a d- couple of different things. He did appear in the uh, Supergirl live action series, apparently as a character in a couple of episodes, and I uh, was in the Flash live action uh, series as well. So, um, you know, there's definitely some some uh, some some DC connections there. Um, I think you're spot on with this, though, as far as being a character, you, you have to be able to be a dynamic, emotional character when you're voicing Cyclops like, yeah. uh, you know, the worst the worst Cyclops of all time was James Marsden because he's a wooden man in that. I mean, he wasn't the great best characterization of that character either, but he was a wooden character in through the all three of those movies that he was in. Um, so you have to have somebody that's able to show a range of emotion and, uh, and be dynamic. He's the leader of the team. And again, maybe that's another reason why that 
characterization in the live action movies cyclops wasn't the leader of the x-men it was very clearly logan uh was the main focal point of those movies so for a show if you're going to do a show and your main character is going to be the leader of the team and it's going to be the cool character that everybody gravitates towards um is basically a co-lead character for your show you have to have somebody that has uh, the ability to to show some emotion to to you know deliver your lines well and yeah i think they 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 cast this one perfectly. It's, it's very hard to, uh, to look at that character and, and hear a different voice. And, um, I was just blown away. I was like, you know, he's, he has a lot to carry for this particular episode, a, a couple of different range of emotions and different scenes, anger, frustration, jealousy, um, and, and encouraging, like he's, he has a, a bunch of different emotions that he has to, has to, uh, you know, to evoke there. And I feel like he does, does a really great job of doing so. So yeah, definitely lost at, uh, gone too soon. Uh, but, uh, you know, this performance, uh, would lead me to, to be interested in hearing more of his performances, of this character for the, the rest of the series. Absolutely. And then, uh, finally we will mention, of course, uh, David K as professor X, um uh folks would know him from uh among other things i think he was he was megatron for a while on the, the on the transformers series and uh and then uh maybe modern folks he's the announcer in like all of the ads and and uh and like and now this segments on last week tonight with john oliver oh okay <laughs> maybe this shouldn't still be a thing uh that that guy he's <laughs> why is this still a thing he's He's the last week tonight announcer as well. But uh, yeah, I, I like him. I, it does feel a little bit like we got not, not insulting his performance, but a little bit like he's clearly feel, it feels like this is a bit more modeled after uh, Patrick Stewart. Obviously the movie was ongoing, so he's not necessarily modeling it on the specific portrayal, but he has that very stately uh, British a British quality, like a a, cl- a classically trained British actor might have. I don't think he does a bad job by any means, but it does feel a little bit more, a little bit more like a like an impression, I think, than maybe some of the other ones do. But maybe that's just me projecting, because the 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 wheelchair and everything made me think of uh, of Patrick Stewart's performance. That's fair. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I, yeah, I think that he probably watched a lot. If obviously this is occurring during the original filming, they didn't, he didn't, wasn't able to watch uh, Sir Patrick Stewart's performance in X-Men, but could certainly go back and watch Star Trek or something like that and model it after that. So I think maybe they just fed him a bunch of those, but yeah, he has a long storied career, a lot of DC uh, connections. He's done uh, a lot of stuff for the recent uh, direct video. Uh, Saul was on his, uh, was on his, um, He's played the question a couple of different times, apparently, too. So very, very interesting there. But um, yeah, I, I think that it's this is the voice that I think of when I think of Professor X. So if you're not going to if you're not going to hear Sir Patrick Stewart's voice, uh, this would be the voice that I would go go for. So um, he has a lot of exposition in this episode, a lot of explaining and introducing and mm-hmm. um telling people what the danger room is and Cerebro (laughs) and what, what his role is and why he's looking for recruit to recruit people and all of that. But um, so it is a lot of exposition and he doesn't have a lot of emotion to show, but uh, professor X really isn't an emotional character either. Typically Uh, he's not portrayed as somebody he's pretty even keeled. So um, yeah, maybe, Maybe not. Uh, maybe not his most notable performance uh, on his uh, on his uh, on his uh, list of list of voice acting performances, or what people would immediately go to uh, when looking at his resume. But I, I think it's a fine fine performance for this episode, and certainly I'm a big fan of his work as Professor X. Absolutely, yeah. So for for all those reasons, like I said, I think a lot of good actors and good performances. I don't know that they had as much to do uh, again, because we were so focused on introducing all these concepts and characters. Um, I ended up settling on an eight out of 10 for my voice acting score. I think everybody does a good solid job of with what's act, asked of them, but maybe nobody really gets a chance to really shine like they perhaps do in later episodes. Yeah, I think that's fair. All right, Liam. Well, that will begin to wrap things up. So let's go ahead and total up our scores for this week. And adding all of my numbers together here, I get a 
23 out of 40 when it comes to everything. Uh, so not, uh, not a great score here for me. What about you? Yeah. And, uh, even though we ended up a couple, just one or two points apart, I think in most of our categories, I was a little bit higher as I ended up with a final score of 27 out of 40. Nice. Um, so we, yeah, we don't have a traditional rewatchability section here to talk about because we don't, uh, we don't come back to these, uh, these Marvel shows, or at least we haven't so far. Um, this is a once a year curtain. I will say, like we said, I think that ending gives you a nice little teaser that makes you want to see more. Like I, I felt that in my, uh, in my fanboy heart when we were, <laughs> when I was finishing up watching the episode before we recorded it here, I'm like, Ooh, Oh, I forgot how cool Magneto is in the show or like, or, or whatever, you know, some of the, the breadcrumbs they laid in this episode. I was like, Oh, it would be cool to see what happens. So I kind of, I kind of don't remember how this all, how this all shakes out in this first season. So, or how they introduce some of the other characters that we see in the opening uh, title sequence, but don't actually make it into the episode yet. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it leaves you wanting more for good and for ill in some ways. That's, that's uh, that's my non uh, rewatchability scale uh, <laughs> review uh, overall review of this. Yeah, you need to watch this because it's the pilot episode. I don't think you have a choice if you're going to watch this show. Mm -hmm. I guess you could drop yourself in the middle of it and figure things out if you know enough about it. But I think as much as we critiqued the idea of it being a, well, then this happens, then they do this, then this sort of plot, uh, it does set you up with giving you a feeling of what the show is, what the main themes are going to be, what the idea behind each character is, you know, how things are different than what you're maybe familiar with, with the previous or other incarnations of the X-Men series. So it's a good base layer foundation for trying to figure out what the rest of the show is. So I can't say that you will have to watch all of these in order, but if you're going to start someplace, well, why not start at the beginning? Am I right? So I'd give it a recommendation based solely on that. And then there's some good stuff in the episode that we pointed out. So if you haven't checked out this uh, this series before and you want to or perhaps you want to revisit it. Uh, yeah, good. Good place to start is at the uh, the beginning. So why not? All right, Liam, well, that would begin to wrap things up for this week. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. As we said at the top, we always enjoy these goofball off the wall one offs. Uh, every single year where we get to do this. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Do you like us doing Marvel cartoons every year? Do you want us to venture out and do something else? We floated other ideas out in the past. Star Wars cartoons. We've talked about doing the Tick animated series, which obviously mm -hmm. was running congruently with Batman, the animated series back in the day. Uh, hey, if that's something that you're interested in seeing, or maybe it's a cartoon that we haven't even mentioned here, something like Dragon Ball Z or something that, you know, that, mm -hmm. that we know that there are legendary fan bases of that would be uh, something that you would love to hear our thoughts on. Uh, you know, sh shoot us an early, uh, early return vote for next year and we'll, uh, we'll see if we can, we can chalk it up and put it in our, uh, in our cap for the, or our filing cabinet for, for next year. So, uh, let us know your thoughts on this review. Let us know on your thoughts on potential further else world else universe i guess it's not even else world it's else universe at this point reviews uh in the future but uh yeah lots lots on the table there that we could look at in the future but uh lots of fun doing this one don't forget uh we're going to ask you a couple different ways to support the podcast if you do like the podcast uh there are many different ways to support us but uh you know there's several that are free the easiest one is to go ahead and subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app uh, make sure that you if you do so uh, you can also support us by leaving a five star review even if you listen on uh, apple or or spotify both platforms allow you to leave a five star review uh those are the main ones that we got our listens from but uh, hey if you listen on one of those other ones too and it gives you an option to leave a f review hey we'll take it there too uh, if you leave a five star review on apple podcasts and leave a little blurb we read your review on air uh and you live within the continental united states we'll even say thank you by sending you a little gift so uh, that's incentive for you to do so. Let us know what you think about our April Fool's reviews. Heck, get AI. It's so easy to leave a review these days. Get AI to, re to write a review <laughs> for you and post it. You don't even have to do the work. Uh, and we'll accept that too. So just as long as it's a five-star review. Uh, 
Uh, we appreciate that. You can also, of course, support us by uh, checking out the links in our show notes. There's a link to our store to pick yourself up a piece of merchandise to support the pod that way, or you can become a monthly supporter uh, using the link directly in there if you want to. We have several monthly supporters that uh, give us their hard-earned dollars. We appreciate their support. And of course, uh, if you want to support the podcast, follow us on social media at DCAU Review on Twitter slash X and Instagram. Uh, we're on both platforms. Heck, we're even on threads occasionally. So uh, interact with us there. Slide into our DMs. Let us know what your thoughts are on this show. Uh, any, If you're a member of one of those fan bases that we pissed off, send all of your hate directly to us through one of those channels. Uh, we'll take it as long as we get some of that sweet, sweet engagement. We don't care. Uh, but seriously, thank you for tuning in. Liam. We are excited. We are turning the page of the calendar. We Well, technically... Technically, our April Fool's show debuted before April, but we're officially turning the calendar page. We're in April, beginning with our next review, which means we're moving on to a new show. That is right, Cal, and we are back once again, going back to to the time period inside the world of the DC Animated Universe, (laughs) where Justice League Unlimited was taking place. And uh, when last we left our listeners, we had just covered Divided We Fall. And uh, since we're not doing epilogue just yet, uh, spoiler alert, as we've said, that's that's the last episode of this show, probably. But uh, we're going to move right into the the next present day adventure that the Justice League went on. That being the episode I Am Legion, which kicks off that whole final uh, season of JLU, a lot of building. Talk about building blocks for an entire season. That episode's got uh, quite a bit of heavy lifting to do. So excited to get into uh, those episodes, which I've definitely seen the least of any Justice League or Justice League Unlimited episodes. So excited to see how uh, to get back and, and look at these episodes with a more critical eye starting next week. We know our listeners love Justice League Unlimited. It often gets our most listened. So. Uh, excited to to get uh, get those listeners back and interested that love the JLU. It's going to be a great month. Can't wait to review it with you, Liam. But until then, I'm Cal. And I'm Liam. And we will talk to you on that next episode of the DCAU Review. See you next year, true believers. <laughs>